We're going to go ahead and look at a two-sample t-test real quick. There's more than one kind of t-test. Uh, there's a one-sample t-test, uh, but we're doing a two-sample t-test. It's also called an independent t-test when you're comparing two samples from the same population. The vocabulary words to be used in this upcoming video are independent t-test, the null hypothesis, the mean, the variance, the standard deviation, the sum of squares, the standard error, pooled variance, probability, also called p-value, degrees of freedom, significance, a one-tailed test, a two-tailed test, effect size, R-squared, and Cohen's scale for effect size. So all of these concepts are briefly described in this video. So, like all t-tests, the null states the same thing, that there is no difference between the means between the groups. And here's the formula for a two-sample t-test, x sub 1 is the mean of the first group, x sub 2 is mean of the second group, s sub 1 is the standard deviation squared, n sub 1 is the sample size for the first group, and this, this information over here is the information from the second group. And here's the actual problem. They took two separate groups. The first group re received a bunch of vitamin B12. And then they were asked to run the 50-yard dash, and their times were recorded after receiving the, the treatment. And they were compared to a group that did not get anything. Okay, so that's, that's the nature of this t-test. So now we're going to plug and chug information into this formula. First thing you always do is you find the mean. So here's the mean of the first group. Here's the mean of the second group. This part of the formula right here is very, very important. You'll notice that the mean subtracts each individual from the group. This whole process is commonly called the sum of squares. And that's what it means up here, this part of the formula, the big sigma means add them all up. The mean minus each individual square them, add them all up. That's called the sum of squares. So back to the problem. We need to use the sum of squares to find the variance. So here's the variance of the first group, variance of the second group down here. We take the square root of the variance to find the standard deviation of each sample size. So there's the standard deviation from the first group, standard deviation from the second group. If it's from a sample, we should be really calling it a standard error. But now we have all the information to plug and chug. So there's the t-test statistic formula. Let's go ahead and plug in all our values. This bad boy down here on the bottom, that's going to tell us how many shared standard deviations away these two means are from each other, right? So if it's going to be more than two standard deviations away, you know we're going to have some kind of trouble. We're going to have to reject the null. But this right here is called a pooled variance between both groups. And then here's our t-test statistic, plugging in real numbers. So we get a final t-test statistic, or a t-score, of negative 3.0508, and we're just going to take the absolute value of it because that's the way t-tests work. I don't want to go into a lot of detail with this. And what that means is the probability of a t of this, 3.0508, with the degrees of freedom is 1 minus the sample size of an individual group, as long as they're the same sample size, and, and ours are, our, this is a paired t-test. So we have to look up this probability in a, in a t table. And with this information, with a t of 3.05, with degrees of freedom of 6, the probability value for a one-sided p-value will fall between 0 0.01 and 0 0.02. Why are we using a one-sided p-value? That's a good question. Because we're checking out a less than problem or a greater than problem. You remember the original null is that the means are equal to each other. We're saying that no, they're not, that one is bigger than the other. So we're going to have a p-value of between 0.01 and 0.02. We're just going to pretend it's going to be 0.015. 
and how you interpret the p-value is change it into a fraction. So 0.015 is literally 15 out of 1,000. And a good way to interpret a p-value is if you repeated this experiment under the same conditions for like a million times, then approximately 15 times per 1,000 experiments, you would get these results. So in other words, the null hypothesis would be true 15 times per 1,000 experiments. That's not very many. That would give us the right to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, we would say there is a significant difference between the group. That word significance means that we did some mathematics on it. Now we're going to go ahead and find the effect size. And the effect size is the variance between the groups can be explained by the effect size r squared. And there's a different formula to find the variance for a t-test, right? If you take the t-test statistic, square it, take it again, add it to the degrees of freedom, and divide everything. So that's just going to be a little bit more math. So we're just going to round off our statistics. So 3 squared over this mess. And again, n was 7. There was 7 in the group. Minus 1 is 6. Go ahead and turn it into a fraction. Turn it into a decimal. 0. 0.6 is our effect size, right? That's, that explains the amount of variance. In other words, 0. 0.6 or 60% of the variance can be explained by which group they're in or and an, another way to put it is by the treatment effect, okay? And Cohen, who is the expert on this, gave us a scale, right? A weak is close to zero, medium is 0.1. Anything over 0.25 is considered strong. So with our model, we can say that 60% of the variance can be explained by the treatment effect, right? The treatment effect, also called the effect size, and that's all there is to it. Hope you enjoyed it. MGZ out.